would stand with us this morning. Join us this morning as we start our worship service to come just as you are to Jesus. seated and I'm going to ask I don't uh, Lorraine if you want to come at this time okay and we're going to give out some quilts of valor Anyway, uh, there, now you can hear me? <laughs> Maybe you didn't want to hear me, did you? <laughs> anyway, uh, who can tell me what Thursday was? Veterans Day. Veterans Day. And we uh, like to honor our veterans, and my wife and several other ladies are part of a group called the Quilt of Valor, and they make quilts, and we give them out to veterans uh, to show our appreciation for what they have done. I was never uh, a veteran. I'm not a veteran. I never was involved in the military. Uh, I decided that the streets of Moscow, Idaho were safer than Saigon, so that's where I went. But I do appreciate the fact that I can come to church every Sunday. Uh, we can come here and we can worship and we can serve the Lord because of what people in the past have done, and so we appreciate that. So the Quilts of Valor are just a way of saying thank you and honoring those that have uh, served in the military for us. 
So we have one that we know of, and he is sitting right there. Chad Billings, you want to come up here, please? <clears throat> we have a quilt for you. Chad, I don't know if you remember, he's been he, a long time ago, a part of our church. So tell us what you did. Uh, I was in light armored reconnaissance. I did uh, reconnaissance missions in the Middle East. That's, I don't know, I was only in for four years. And where did you serve? Where in the Middle East were you at? Uh, all over the Mediterranean Sea. I, I usually traveled on ship, so I got to see quite a bit of the world. <laughs> and you were in which branch? The Marines. The Marines. Okay. So this is just a little way in which we can say thank you for what you did uh, to uh, help it so that us that we could have the freedoms to do what we do. So let's give not only him. Is there anybody else that has not received a quilt of valor? If you haven't, if you're a veteran, you need to. Where did my wife go? Oh, there you are. <laughs> You need to let her know because that's what they do is they wait make... A minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Were you in the military? Get up here again. Oh. <clears throat> okay, tell us about your military experience. I was in the Coast Guard for six years. I, I, didn't get, I served in Okinawa and uh, Hawaii. That was my stations, but You're tough in Hawaii. Huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we appreciate that, and we do have a quilt here for you. Now you have to help me because Beth is the participant. Is it okay. Down? Yes. This is what it looks like on the other side. Wow, walk right out here in front. Okay, so there you go. All right, mother and son in the military. All right. All right, thank you for your service. I do have just a couple of announcements to share with you. And one of them is, the first one is not in your bulletin, and that's Scott uh, asked me to share with you that there is a need for a few additional children's church workers. So if that's a ministry that you would like to be involved in or help serve in, uh, talk to Scott or talk to Sherilyn Spencer and they would love to hear from you. And then the rest of them are in the bulletin. Grief Share tomorrow is doing, no, Tuesday, excuse me, is doing a Surviving the Holidays. And so that's a one standalone evening. If you've lost someone, if you think this would be of benefit to you, you're invited and encouraged to come here to the church Tuesday of this week at 6 p.m. Uh, for that event. Then also the shoebox, the shoeboxes, all 620 of them, I know, there was, I know at least one was added, uh, are leaving this Thursday. And so we're going to gather here at the church, it looks like at 5 p.m., to help load those up, and then they make a short journey down the road to New Hope, where they'll be for a time, and then from there they go to their final destinations. So if you can help on the 18th this Thursday with loading those boxes, please come. And a lot of hands make it a very quick job. And then finally, the annual family gathering and business meeting is next Sunday. So next Sunday. And we have a, a fellowship meal as part of that. Uh, you'll see in your bulletin. We're suggesting, you know, A to J, bring certain items, and K to R, other items, and uh, S to Z, bring desserts. 
So we'd love to have you come and enjoy that Thanksgiving dinner with us. And then there will be a short business meeting that will be part of that where we affirm our budget. We'll also affirm some people in, in various offices, um, give a financial statement, a financial report. And then as I said last Sunday, Dick Yoder is coming back on as an active elder. And so we'll be affirming that next Sunday as well. Uh, final thing I guess I'll mention is that our Sunday school, Kelly Bissinger was gone today, so we didn't do our, uh, the estate planning Sunday school class. That will start again next Sunday. And so if you're interested in that, and of course a lot of you should be interested in that, um, Kelly's a wealth of information, and so the rest of November will be his, and so come and learn about wise stewardship principles. Okay? I'm going to read today from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. And 1 Peter is a book that talks about persecution, talks about Christians who are suffering because of their faith. And so I want to begin by reading these words to you. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. This is the word of the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though we have not seen him, or though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you, not, you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. As we spend just a few moments in prayer today, our list hasn't changed very much in the last couple of weeks, but we do have a number of folks that are part of our congregation or part of our broader uh, relationship chains uh, that we're praying for. We're continuing to pray for Jackie Doherty. The news that she's been receiving from her cancer treatment has been positive, but we want to continue to pray for Jackie and for Mark as she now uh, begins to recover from all of that. Um, Phyllis, how's your daughter doing? Okay, but she's home. So Phyllis, pray for Phyllis and pray for Rebecca. Um, continue to pray for Lori Nelson after foot surgery. Um, our shoe boxes as they go overseas. Veronica last Sunday mentioned someone who I mentioned morning and evening. Her name's Carrie. And she was involved in a very serious car accident, but she is recovering. And so if you remember that, continue to pray for Carrie. And then God's blessing upon our worship service. There's other things as well, but let's spend a few moments in prayer. Father God, we do thank you for uh, this day that you've given to us. Uh, we've been reminded from Scripture that sometimes part of the Christian life does involve trials and struggles and even persecutions. We know that one of the one of the greatest heirs, I dare say heresies, of the modern American evangelical church is that if you're a Christian, you won't have difficulties or struggles. Uh, we know that that's not biblical. We know that Jesus went to the cross where he was crucified. We know that Peter and Paul suffered much. And we know that scripture tells us that we will suffer for the name of Christ. And so, Lord, we, we accept that today. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you will help us to believe that anything that we suffer for the name of Christ 
will be more than compensated, uh, particularly in glory. That our, our afflictions, whatever they might be, are light and momentary, Paul tells us, when compared to the glory that will be ours. And I pray that we will believe that, latch onto it, hold tightly to it. Lord God, we also come to you today and we confess that we are sinners saved by grace. Uh, we confess that we have fallen short of your standard, but we rejoice that Christ came into this world to die for our sins, that we can be accepted in your sight, that we really are saints because of Christ and because of his word. We do pray for those in our congregation, some of whom we've mentioned this morning, who are hurting in various ways. And I do continue to pray for Jackie Dwarty. And I ask, Lord, that you will be with her as she now, I think, is moving hopefully more into the phase of recovering from all the treatments uh, that she's received as, as the process of trying to deal with cancer in her body. So we lift her up to you. We lift up Mark as well. We pray that you will encourage them. We pray for some of these women in our church uh, who have been injured in various ways, Rebecca and Lori. And we just thank you for modern medicine. And we ask, Lord, that their bones will heal, that they'll heal fully. Uh, we thank you. We, we praise you for the shoebox ministry. And, and as these boxes are leaving us this week, we we do ask your blessing upon each one of them as, as they will go to the far ends of this world. We don't know where they'll go, but they'll hopefully find their way into the hands of, of a child, a boy or a girl. And I pray that as they open these boxes and as they uh, enjoy the items within them, but also as they recognize that there's a connection to Christ and to the gospel, I pray, Lord, that you will use these boxes for good in their lives. And I pray, Lord, that the churches, those local churches that will play a role in distributing these boxes, that these boxes will provide an opportunity for those churches to minister to those children. And so we don't know what you will do with this, but we know that you will use it. And we pray that you'll use it in some powerful ways uh, in days and, and weeks and perhaps even months to come. Uh, we thank you for the day that you've given to us. We thank you that we can gather here to worship you. Uh, we pray, Lord, that our worship will be sweet in your sight, um, that you'll help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. May your spirit minister to us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you stand with me, let's say, say together the uh, Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise to the King, His throne transcends, His crown and kingdom never end, now and throughout eternity. Oh, praise the One who died for me. I don't know who's in charge of Children's Church. Cheryl Lynn. Okay, kids, this is your opportunity to follow Cheryl Lynn to Children's Church. He did. I did not know that. I heard he was going to have surgery, but I didn't know that it had happened. So he had it on Friday? Okay. Well, we should remember Mike and Carrie in our prayers as he recovers from that. 
All right, today we're continuing in our study of Exodus. We are in Exodus chapter 3, and we're going to consider a longer passage of Scripture. We're going to consider the verses starting in chapter 3, verse 16, and we'll try to go through chapter 4 and verse 9. So that is a fairly lengthy uh, passage for us to consider today. As we approach this text, I want to just stop and remind you of where Moses is as he receives these words. And of course, the answer to that question is that he is standing before the burning bush. And I don't want us to lose sight of that that Moses is still at the burning bush. Now we remember that Moses starts well. In other words, he has a healthy response to seeing a glimpse, if you will, of God's glory. And that response is recorded for us back in, I believe it's verse 6. We read, Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. And yet as the conversation continues, as it does in our text this morning and as it will into next week also, we know that Moses not only speaks to God, but he also eventually argues with him. And so I want to remind you that the patience of God in dealing with Moses is really quite remarkable. The providence of God in this text is also very remarkable. And in fact, I would say it is probably the most striking feature of this text. And what I mean by that is that God gives to Moses the storyline of the Exodus in advance. That really is the, the majority of the material that we're going to look at this morning, God in his providence, nothing that is happening is catching God off guard. As I sometimes like to point out, God is the author. And so we're looking at a story. It's a true story. But God is the author of this story. And our word author and our word authority are connected words. And so God is the author who is in authority over all of these coming events. And so he narrates in advance to Moses what is about to happen. And so we have this interesting reality, whereas with Moses, everything is increasingly uncertain and unsettled in his mind. His mind is muddy. And Moses doesn't know that he wants this job. In fact, He's quite certain he doesn't want this job. And yet the contrast here with God is remarkable because nothing is uncertain in God's mind. Nothing is unsettled in God's mind. Nothing is muddy in God's mind. And so God simply announces to Moses the job that he has for him, the promise of his presence with Moses, and then he gives Moses assurance through mighty promises and through mighty signs. There are five promises given, and we'll look at each one of those individually. And then into chapter 4, we'll look at three signs that God gives to Moses to give him further assurance. And so we're going to just walk through this text one verse at a time. But the first of these mighty signs or promises that God makes to Moses is given to us in verses 16 and 17. And it is this thought that the Lord will deliver. Now, by the way, another way to break this text up, I did not do this, but you could preach the text this way, to draw attention that there are two speeches in this text. There's a speech given to the elders... To the, to the ones who Moses is going to go to. In other words, God is saying, I've got two speeches for you to give. One is to the elders of Israel, 
And the second speech I have for you to give is a speech to Pharaoh. And so God even narrates for Moses what to say. I mean, Moses is left with just the reality. All I need to do here is trust and obey. God's made all the promises. God's shown me these miraculous signs. And God has put words in my mouth. Public speaking is a great fear, they say. But it's easier when someone gives you a speech. All you have to do is, so to speak, read it. So in all of this, we see the provision of God for Moses. But the first of these promises, how I'm going to structure this, is not so much on the speeches given, but the promises that are made. The first of these, again, the Lord will deliver. Verses 16 and 17. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them... So Moses says, I'm not an eloquent public speaker. Well, God says, here's the speech. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites. And I guess we should stop there. I want to make one observation from these verses. It's the ESV renders the Hebrew, I have observed. So God is saying, say to the elders of Israel that I have observed what has been done to you in Egypt. Now, this phrase is more often in the Old Testament translated using the word visited. As in, I have visited you. And there's a number of passages where we see this. There's a text in the book of Ruth. Where if you remember that story, there's a famine that strikes the land. And, and Ruth's mother-in-law and that family, they go and they, they spend time in Moab. And eventually they receive word that the Lord had visited his people in Israel and had given them food. And so they return. Or there's a text in Genesis where it says the Lord visited Sarah. Because she of course was a barren woman and God allowed her to conceive a child. Or one other example, and it's just a page back in my Bible, perhaps it's a page back in yours as well. In Genesis chapter 50, in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 24, almost the very last verse of the book of Genesis, and Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you. And bring you out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And so in our text this morning, that is the word used here. Again, my Bible translated, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. But it is this familiar expression, I have visited you. And it is reminding us that God is totally aware of all that is happening to them and all that has happened to them over a period of several centuries. Now, this point has already been made in the Exodus story and it will be made again. But it appears to us that God wants us to not overlook this because he keeps pointing it out. He keeps drawing our attention to this. And it's communicating to us this reality that in suffering, whether it's in the Exodus text or whether it's in your life today at this moment, if you are suffering in some way, that God is not indifferent to what has come upon you. That God is aware of it. That God is concerned. That God does see and that God does no. And I also want to point out to you that for literally centuries, Jewish people living in Egypt, 
experienced adversity and persecution and trials at the hands of the Egyptians, and God was aware, concerned, and saw them during that entire period of time even though some of those individuals literally would have been born into slavery and they died still in slavery. And so they did not themselves see the deliverance of God, but there is a reminder in this text that God was fully aware of what they were experiencing. It isn't that God at this moment finally decides to care Rather, the text affirms that God has always cared. Now, the point that I would make from this is that we are living in God's story, aren't we? Ultimately, this is not our story. And God's story is bigger than all of us. So there were individuals who were, who were observed by God known by God, God was concerned for them, and yet they did not live to see the deliverance. But God saw, God knew, and God was concerned. And so this is the plan of God. It is the story of God being unfolded before our eyes. And so now in the fullness of time, the time is right. If you will, the sin of the seven Canaanite nations has come to its fullness. The time is right. God is going to intervene. God is going to deliver. But again, it isn't at this moment that it's as if someone shakes God awake. No, God has been fully aware through all of this. You see, it's a reminder to us that we might not see the deliverance that we seek in this life. That does not mean that God has deserted us or God has abandoned us. Because the text tells us that God knows and God cares. So if that is your reality or your situation, what I would encourage you to do is to reason this out through Scripture and to recognize that whatever God is allowing in my life, it is something bigger than me. And God ultimately has a good purpose in it and for it. Someday there's a young man here who will hear and speak. Okay? But that's God's plan, that's God's story, and it is ultimately in God's timing. So mighty promises, the Lord is a delivering God. He will deliver. And so we wait in faith for him to do so. Then second of all, there's this mighty promise given to Moses, which I assume Moses needed to hear at this moment, and that's the promise that the people will listen. Look with me at verse 18. After mentioning the Amorites, Perizzites, Evites, Jebusites, and all the ites of the Old Testament, or at least many of them, we come to verse 18, this second promise, and they, they here refers to Israel, the Hebrew people, they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt, to Pharaoh, and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go on a three-day journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Now, I'm not going to get into this, but I want to just tell you of assurance, of assurance today that when they said to Pharaoh, which they eventually do, we want to go on a three-day journey into the wilderness, they're not really trying to deceive Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's not deceived. He knows exactly what this means. We're not coming back. Well, there's no real ambiguity in this. It might be just a, a way of stating it, a way of speaking. I mean, we do things like this, I suppose. If I say to someone in my household, uh, give me please the, what we call the flipper dipper. That's the remote control. What am I really saying? I'm taking charge of the television. We're going to watch what I want to watch. Right? Or if I say to you, um, 
I'd like a moment of your time. I'm not really asking for a moment of your time, am I? I'm asking for a sizable chunk of your time, perhaps. And so we also have a way of stating things, and that's what you have here. It's a bit odd to us when we read this, but the three days journey is not we're going to go have a spiritual retreat and then we're coming back to Egypt. No, it's we're going out and we're not coming back. Now Moses is told here that the elders will go with him, so there's some support in this, which should have been an encouragement to him. But the primary thought here is just this idea, the people will listen to you. Because of course that's Moses, one of his primary objections. In fact, God is anticipating this, isn't he? Because in chapter 4, verse 1, even after hearing the promise, look what Moses says, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. And I suppose Moses had reason to think this would be the case because he remembers 40 years previous when as the young prince in Egypt, he tried to deliver the people in his own power, in his own strength, and that didn't work well. That was a colossal failure. And now 40 years later, Moses, at the age of 80, being sent back to Egypt, and he says, he has this fear, they won't listen, they won't follow me. They didn't follow me before. Why should I think they will follow me now? And what's the answer to that? Because God said so. That's the best answer, isn't it? God is aware of this fear. God is aware of this concern. So he addresses it beforehand. And he says, they will follow you. And so trust me in this. They will follow you and I will go with you. Now, <clears throat> the third promise, which I suppose isn't really good news, but it is a promise in the sense of God is foretelling it in advance, is this idea that Pharaoh will resist. And of course, we know that, if we know the rest of the story, the resistance of Pharaoh becomes central to everything that's about to happen. But it's not a surprise to God. Look at verse 19. For I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. Now that last statement, compelled by a mighty hand, is one of those statements that can be taken in different ways. It's a question of how you choose to interpret the actual Hebrew found here. And I want to give you an example of a different way of understanding this, which I actually think is probably right. Let me quote to you from the New King James Version of the Bible and how they render this statement. It reads as follows. But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not even by a mighty hand. Now, if this rendering is correct, I submit to you the mighty hand probably refers to a human hand. So a paraphrase might read as follows. This is the sense of it. For I know that the kingdom of Egypt will not let you go. Not even by the most mighty human hand will he release you. In other words, there's no power on the planet. No human power that can overcome Pharaoh. There is no king, no general, no prince, no coalition of nations. We've just had mentioned in the previous verse this whole list of nations, and many of these were powerful nations. The Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Jebusites. If, if they came as a coalition united against Pharaoh and against Egypt, they in their might could not overcome this man and his army. They could not release you. There is no one who can release the children of Israel because there is no one who can overcome the mighty hand, the mighty arm of Pharaoh. This is the most powerful person on planet earth. Do you get the point? 
For I know that the king of Egypt, he will not let you go. He will not be impressed. He will not be intimidated. He will not be compelled by the mightiest of all human hands. No, there is need for a greater hand to be involved in this. Now what hand would that be? Well, look at the next verse. I, the God of the burning bush, the self-existing God, the eternal God, the all-powerful God, the holy God, the transcendent God, I will stretch out my hand and I will strike Egypt with all my wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. So no one can deliver you but God alone. There is a hand more powerful even than Pharaoh's hand. So Pharaoh will resist, but I just read the next promise. The Lord will strike Egypt. That's verse 20. The Lord will strike Egypt. I will stretch out my hand. I will strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. Now the word strike... We know how that comes out in the rest of the text. The word that we normally associate with what happens to Pharaoh and the Egyptians is the, the ten plagues, right? The word plagues, how God plagued Pharaoh and the Egyptians. I want to take you back for just a moment to Genesis chapter 12. You think about God knowing the story in advance. In Genesis chapter 12, there's a passage which really gives us the Exodus story in advance. It takes us all the way back to the beginning, back to the very root of the children of Israel. And what is that root's name? Abraham, right? Abraham is the root. And these people now entrapped in Egypt, they are his descendants several centuries removed. In Genesis chapter 12, let me begin reading in verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land. Is that reminiscent of a later story? Why did the children of Israel end up in Egypt? Because of a famine in the land. And you remember how Joseph had been sent before them to prepare the way, if you will, even though he suffered so much. And the famine came upon the land and, and the sons of Jacob came into Egypt. And eventually the whole family came to Egypt where they remained for centuries. So this is centuries before all of that. But the narrative is so similar. There was a famine in the land. So Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there for the famine was severe in the land. And I won't read the next verses to you. I'll just explain it. While Abraham is in Egypt, there is a crisis. It is a crisis partly of Abraham's own making. It is an example of stupidity. But the result of this crisis is that Abraham's family is in jeopardy. They are threatened. And therefore the promises made to Abraham are threatened. What I'm interested in is God's response to all of this as Abraham finds himself in this difficult situation in this foreign country. We have the mention of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And then look down to verse 17. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh. Now, the English Standard Version, which I am using this morning, strikes out here. They could have hit a home run, but they didn't. Because the word that is used in the text, the Hebrew text, is not the word afflicted. It is true that God afflicted Pharaoh, but that misses the point. They get it right the second time, but it, they should have it this way twice. What the text literally states is the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. It's the first occurrence of the word plague in the Bible. 
It's the second occurrence of the word plague. It's used twice in verse 17. Then the word disappears from the Bible until we come to the book of Exodus and the great plagues that God poured out upon the Egyptians. Now don't be a slow reader here. God wants you to connect these passages and to recognize that what is about to happen in Exodus has already happened. The family taken into Egypt because of a famine, finding themselves in a difficult situation. By the way, as a result of this, Pharaoh enriches Abraham and he leaves the land, literally taking with him the loot of Egypt. We see that again, don't we? And the plaguing of Pharaoh and his people is at the very center of this. So what we're to take is the idea that God has done this before. God has delivered this way before and he will do so again. Capiche? The Lord will strike Egypt. And then the next promise is the Lord will grant favor. The Lord will grant favor. Look at verses 21 and 22. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor. And any woman who lives in her house. Why would... Jewish women be living in the house of an Egyptian. Well, these are slaves, you see. It's also interesting. It's just an observation, but even in the ancient world, it appears that women controlled a lot of the family wealth. Any woman who lives in her house, ask her for silver, for gold, for jewelry, for clothing. They shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. Now remember, this is the same group of people, I mean the Egyptians who not long ago were willing to obey Pharaoh and throw the baby Hebrew boys into the Nile River. And so here we have in the providence of God his power to take one's enemies and to use that enemy in order to bless his own people. And by the way, there's an allusion in this text also to something earlier in the book of Genesis. Back in Genesis 39 and verse 21. Let me just read uh, this to you. Chapter 39 and verse 21. So the phrase I'm thinking about here in our text is this idea of granting favor. I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. That exact phrase, word for word, is only found three times in the Exodus story. And I think nowhere else in the, New Test in the Old Testament except for one passage. I will grant favor. I will take your enemy and cause your enemy to bless you. I will grant favor in the eyes of your enemy. Again, it's found three times in the Exodus story. The only other place where we find this phrase word for word is in Genesis chapter 39 and verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph, and he showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And if you know the Joseph story, you know all that he experienced, all that went wrong, all that was against him. And yet in all of it, the providence of God is at work, and God favors Joseph. And so here the reminder that God will favor the children of Israel. They will plunder the Egyptians. It's a promise given to them by God. And we assume that this plunder will be used to build the tabernacle with which the children of Israel will worship God during their wilderness wandering. So five promises of God. Let me just remind you of them. The Lord will deliver 
The people will listen. Pharaoh will resist. The Lord will strike Egypt. The Lord will grant favor. And that brings us to chapter 4 and verse 1. Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. They will say, The Lord did not appear to you. God is patient, isn't he? I mean, the patience of God, the long-suffering of God in all of this. At this point, God does not rebuke. Rather, God continues to give assurance, and he does through now through three mighty signs. And so we'll look at those briefly before we close today. Three mighty signs. The first of these is the staff to the snake. Reading in verse 2, The Lord said to him, What is in your hand? He said, A staff. Now that staff becomes pretty important, doesn't it, in this story? I mean, think of all the times that God uses this staff for a variety of reasons and uses, but what they all have in common is that this becomes the staff or the rod of judgment. Moses wields this staff, this rod, to bring judgment, generally speaking, upon God's enemies. But this is the beginning of all of that. The Lord said to him, what is in your hand? Of course, this is the shepherd's crook. I assume Moses had used this instrument for decades. It's just an, an ordinary staff. He said, throw it to the ground. So he threw it to the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. Now Moses does show some faith, don't you think? I don't know much about catching snakes. I frankly don't want to know anything about catching snakes. But I have seen a few videos of snake catchers, and I think what they do is they pin the neck, don't they? and they pick it up behind the neck. That would, see, that would seem to be the safest place to have a snake. Picking up a snake by the tail doesn't seem all that safe to me. But Moses does obey. It might have been the most courageous thing Moses had done in his entire life to this point. Put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand once again. And we, of course, know that this sign and the second sign were signs that Moses was able to reproduce time and time and time again. I guess I should step back for just a moment and remind you, as I have many, many times, what a sign is. Here's a theological definition. A sign is something that points beyond itself to a greater spiritual reality. So when we celebrate communion, the bread, the wine, these are signs. They point to the greater spiritual reality of the body and the blood of Christ. And so this is called here in our text a sign given to Moses because it's pointing beyond itself to this greater reality, which ultimately, of course, is the power of God. Now, we are not given an explanation as to why these signs rather than some others. Now I take from that, I assume from that observation that it would have been so readily apparent to Moses that there is no explanation needed. He would have understood immediately the significance of this. We, however, do not. Because we're removed from these events for 3,500 years. So we need to speculate just a little bit, and, and we'll do that briefly. We do know that Pharaoh wore a crown adorned with what's called a ureus. Now, a ureus had the face of a cobra upon it. We also know that Pharaoh usually would have carried a staff of his own, a scepter, if you will, which also would have had the face of a cobra upon it. 
Now, the meaning of that is pretty clear to us. Pharaoh is saying to all his dinner guests and all his emissaries and visitors from foreign countries, don't mess with me. I'm the most formidable military power on the face of the earth. And my ureus, my crown, is communicating that truth to you. I will sting you like a cobra. I will take your life. Play nice. Get out your checkbook and write your tributes. I mean, it's something along those lines. And of course, we know eventually the staff which becomes a serpent will eat alive. Pharaoh's staffs turn to serpents. So I think the meaning, we might not entirely understand everything that is to be known here, but I think it's pretty clear that what God is saying is that I'm a lot mightier than Pharaoh. Maybe he's saying, you know, Pharaoh, this, this cobra, this snake, you're going to have him right by the tail. We have an expression, right? Have him by the tail. I mean, it's okay, Moses. Trust me in this. The second sign is clean flesh made leprous. Skip down to verses 6 and following. But let me read. I think I've skipped some verses here. Let's, let's start with verse 4. But the Lord said to Moses, Put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, Put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside the cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then the Lord said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the later sign. A more literal rendering, it's a little bit awkward, but it'd be something like this. If they don't believe the first sign, maybe they will listen. They will listen to the voice. That's in the text. They will listen to the voice of the later sign. So in other words, these signs are speaking. They are revealing. There's a deeper theological truth we could make from this, that God speaks in various ways. He speaks through his word. He, th he speaks through scriptures. He also speaks through creation run riot in this instance. He communicates. If they don't hear the first voice, maybe they will listen to the voice of the second sign. I don't have a whole lot to say about this sign other than a God who can control disease is a mighty God, don't you think? As I thought about those verses this week, I thought about all that we spend on trying to stay healthy. And all the hospitals, even in small communities, we have hospitals. And, and the threat of all of these diseases, and we know that disease stalks us, and unless Christ returns, we know that someday it will get us. And so we're afraid of diseases. We're afraid of cancer, for instance. In the ancient world, leprosy was a mighty enemy. The word used here could refer to a number of different skin diseases, but we're familiar with Hansen's disease, with leprosy. There was no cure. It was a terrible disease. And yet the message being sent here is that God is bigger than and over those things which master and control us. I think it would have been a mighty sign, don't you think? And then the last sign, which is the greatest of them. It's different because it's not something that Moses could reproduce over and over again. Verse 9. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice... You shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. 
And the water that you take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. And of course, this does become the first plague, doesn't it? What an awesome display of power. The Nile was venerated in Egypt. It was a god. That's not quite right. It was a god and a goddess. Because in iconography, when the Nile is personified as a god, it's also a goddess. What does that mean? It's both. It's personified as male to suggest fertility. It's also personified as female because it's the one who nurtures life. The Nile was a mighty god. In fact, even in modern times, I have read that the Nile is one of the most densely populated places on planet Earth. Because Egypt is, so much of it is such a desert, such a wasteland, that even the modern population of Egypt tends to cling to the shores of the Nile River. That is where life comes from for them. This was even more so the case in the ancient world. So to destroy the Nile is literally to destroy Egypt. And that is what God is threatening to do here and that is what God will eventually do. So as we close today, I'm going to close with just one thought. It's hard to imagine any person in the Bible other than Jesus himself being asked to do a greater, harder, more significant work than Moses was asked to do. If we stop and think about this, what Moses is being assigned is absolutely impossible. To walk into the White House and to tell the most powerful nation, the most powerful ruler on the planet, we're supreme now. It's an impossible job. And yet the whole thrust of the text is that God does impossible things. And with God, all things are possible. So here's my final thought. This text is calling us to do something very simple, but it is so very hard. It is simply calling us to trust and to obey the promises of God. That's what Moses was asked to do to trust and obey the promises of God. That is what God asks of us today, to trust and obey the promises of God. To trust a person. To trust a person who knows you, who knows the good, who knows the bad, who knows the joy, who knows the sorrow. This text is calling you to trust him in the midst of the sorrow. To trust him even if you do not see the deliverance. Knowing that God is afoot and God's purposes are just bigger than little people like us. We're little, but God sees us and knows us. Let's pray. Father God, I do pray for us today. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will use this text for good in our lives. This text has largely taken our eyes off of ourselves. It's seeking to fix our gaze on you. And I pray, Lord, that it will succeed in doing that, that your Holy Spirit will use it in that way in our lives, that we will gaze upon you, your greatness, your sufficiency, that that will comfort our hearts that it will help us to trust and obey in every situation in which we find ourselves. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
you stand with us, we're going to close with, Great is thy faithfulness. standing and as we're going to close, let's say together this week the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Father God, I thank you for all of those truths. I thank you for the communion of the saints. I thank you that we can gather here in this room to worship you physically present together. I thank you for the forgiveness of sins. I thank you for sending the Lord Jesus Christ. We realize that he is the great redeemer. 
And the Exodus redemption story ultimately points forward to him, the one who redeems us from slavery to sin. I ask, Lord, your blessing upon this week as we walk into it. Help us, Lord, to trust you, to obey you, and to know that you walk with us. This week might be murky to us, but it is known by you. These saints we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.